So uh, today, uh, guest speaker. Faces uh, today. So can I just be introduced? So Sushmita is there, and then what is your name? Akhil. Okay. Manushi. <coughs> Anusha, Anusha, yeah. Shami. Okay. Thik. And you are Abhinav, right? All right. So um, we have in the two lectures, you know, discussed truth and non violence. Uh, those are the important values on which Gandhi's entire life and experiments, as he calls them, uh, his autobiography is called My Experiments with Truth. And everybody he does is essentially based on truth and nonviolence. So, you know, anything he does, whether it is Satyagraha or you know, whatever. So, the understanding of truth and nonviolence is key to understanding Gandhi. And, and uh, as part of this course, you have to do two things. For the benefit of the people who are here for the first time, uh, so one is that you have to um, uh, look around and I. You may think that you know um, in many cases, but you'll be surprised that that. Uh, once you start looking out, you will find many situations where uh, people have uh, used Gandhian methods, uh, you know, in their lives or in communities and even countries. Some of the examples that uh, we have considered so far are uh, uh, a tribal village in Maharashtra, Menda Lekha, where uh, in in uh, a line with the Gandhian uh, philosophy of Ram Swaraj, the entire village manages its own affair without any interference of uh, the administrative officials of the government. In fact, they don't allow the officials to come into the village. They say yeah. anybody who wants to come can come as an outsider, as an observer, but cannot uh, take decisions for us. We will take our own decisions. So this is in line with the Gandhian uh, philosophy of uh, Gram Swaraj, uh, where he wanted every village to become self-reliant. Then we uh, have also, I have yet to share that article uh, with you on this territory in Europe, which is jointly controlled by two countries. So something like Kashmir, you know, between two countries, 
although both the countries are laying claims, and India doesn't think it is a disputed thing. It, it considers that you know it has been part of it is occupied by Pakistan, but nevertheless, it remains a problem, and uh, uh, the both countries and the Kashmiris themselves are still looking for a solution. Uh, we had uh, Ila Gandhi yesterday, who uh, in our class, who has actually pardoned the killers of her son. Uh, one among the only two ladies I know who have done such thing. Uh, the other is uh, a wife of Graham Staines, the Christian missionary who was killed by Bajrang Dal workers in uh, Odisha. So she pardoned the killers of her husband and her two sons who were burnt in a jeep. And uh, she left this country, went back to Australia. Uh, there is also the uh, you know process of dialogue between United States and earlier Soviet Union, now Russia, where they are trying to curtail their arms. Of course, now Putin has walked out of it because of the Russia-Ukraine war, but uh, the two countries were seriously engaged in a process of dialogue where they wanted to limit their arms. And they have actually brought down the the number of uh, arms, and they also have a mechanism through which they can inspect each other's facilities. So every year, they are every year twice they are supposed to give a list of their facilities. That is where they store their arms and where they manufacture their arms, and the other country is allowed to visit them. So amazing, uh, you know, agreement, but uh, it does allow the enemy country to to inspect their facilities. Similarly, Argentina and Brazil at one time were uh, had had were going to start a nuclear arms race. When they realized the futility of it, the countries entered into a serious dialogue process and decided that they will not make weapons. They will not make nuclear weapons. They formed a committee of 50 scientists and 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 citizens. 25 from each country, and it was the responsibility of this committee of 50 to ensure that neither of the two countries will make nuclear weapons, right? So this is a very Gandhian way of solving your problem, even though they may not have, you know, mentioned Gandhi when they arrived at the solution. But this is the way, uh, you know, some people, some countries, some communities have solved their problems. So you have to look for one such example, uh, a unique example, um, and then you also have to look for a problem. Um, could be Russia-Ukraine war, uh, could be something in your personal life, right? Uh, you're trying to discipline yourself, but you're not able to. So how do you use Gandhian principles? And Example of it, it was uh, uh, that you know how do you reduce your overconsumption, because the the Gandhian idea is that uh, the the idea of uh, Swaraj is that you you limit your needs to the basic minimum. Um, so anything anything that you you feel like, uh, choose a unique problem, and propose your Gandhian solution to. And before you do this in the form of a thousand word article, which you should try to get published in some newspaper or a portal, and the Yanadu editor here on the first day, and he will be happy to publish anything. He said it should be original. So if you if you if you come up with an original piece of writing of thousand words, it will get into Yanadu in Telugu. They will translate it for you if you can't write Telugu. Uh, but write it in what, whatever language uh, that you want and uh, submit it. Uh, so this uh, uh, will be one part of the uh, thing. And then you have to do a Gandhian act. So uh, you decide. You um, either uh, solve an estranged relationship problem. You know, by apologizing, by talking to uh, whoever your opponent is, and 
with whom you had a fight uh, or you know uh, an unknown person a stranger who you feel is in distress needs some help provide him or help but at a, at a human level not not uh, in a charitable fashion so which means that and even if you don't provide help in in physical terms if you can if you can uh, build a relationship on an equal terms where the other person also feels equal and some people have this capacity they are very good at you know making friends uh, so but at a human level where where you can empathize with that person and that person also feels that yeah please Shivan Pandey is there in this class, but today he is not visible. Yes, not now. No, he is not here. Okay. Yeah, but why are you looking for him? Oh, if you find him, you tell him that I am also looking for him because he should be here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So you know, uh, at, at a personal level, so so because Gandhi believed in in relationships i mean he he was an amazing person who uh, whose relationships with his enemies were not of antagonistic nature you know he he would would deal with his enemies so that in the end the enemy would become friend right so if if i have to say it in gandhian language the only way to finish your enemy is to make him or her your friend. That was Gandhi's approach. So you see, when he goes to talk to these all these British officials, um, at a personal level, you know he has a very friendly relationship with. Him. So, so that that was his his unique kind of way of, of approaching an enemy, where he. And you, I'm sure you must have heard that, uh, you know, the evil, not the evil doer, right? So, uh, he believed in the goodness of an individual. And so with that kind of approach, you know, uh, build a relationship with the person. Right. So, so any, anything that you feel like you are free to discuss it with me. Um, I am available. I have a phone number now, which I have shared in the mail, and uh, I am available in the library. Uh, come and see me in the in the night. If you let me know, I will be there at the time. Otherwise, uh, you know, after dinner, ten, eleven. So today, yes, yeah. Let me give you the mic. Uh, so, with uh, the advent of work culture, where work culture, where people get cancelled kind of for stating politically incorrect statements that might not match other sentiments. Uh, if uh, Gandhi was there in such a scenario, so my question is, how would he react to this context? Yeah, I think if, if you say something or believe in something. Yes. Yes. So there is the example of Gandhi Ambedkar, right? So, uh, actually, I mean, when Gandhi met Ambedkar for the first time, he did not even know. Actually, Ambedkar's name was given to him by his teacher. Uh, it was a Brahmin surname. Uh, so, uh, and they met in England. Conference, and it was when Ambedkar started speaking that Gandhi realized that, you know, he uh, was a Dalit, 
and of course, the Dalit term had not become popular at that time. Uh, but uh, uh, and Gandhi's position on caste is very well known in the beginning. He was a believer in the caste system, and it was only through his interactions with Ambedkar, you know, that he realized the uh, oppression that is carried out in the name of caste. So, so he was willing to learn, and he changed his viewpoint towards the end of his life. He had. So first he said, you know, he, so from a believer in caste system, he came to a position where he said he would only attend inter-caste marriages and towards the fag end of his life, he said he would go only to those marriages in, in which at least one of the sites was there. So he had arrived at almost the same position at Ambed, as Ambedkar. Thought that, you know, the, the caste system would have to be dismantled. And in, in AICC meetings, he uh, made it a point that uh, uh, removal of untouchability and uh, you know, dismantling of caste system was on the political agenda of the Congress party. So, uh, that, but this is an example where, where Gandhi was willing to change. But what if you are not willing to change, right? You hold on to a position and then you are questioned and then I would still say dialogue. If the, if the opposite party is willing to dialogue with you. So I have faced situations like this. I mean, three times in my life, you know, I have almost come very close to be beaten up by the RSS people. Two times, my fr one time my friend saved me, another time, uh, Similar looking friend, you know, who also wears kurta pajama and has a beard, he got beaten up, <laughs> you know, because of mistaken identity. And so his, he, he actually uh, uh, was, um, he's uh, no more, but uh, uh, he uh, was a writer, Marathi writer. So uh, after the event, he said, I, I don't have any regret in getting beaten up by RSS, but uh, I got beaten up. Uh, you know, because they thought I was Sandeep Pandey, that is something you know, I, I don't like. I should have been beaten up as Sanjay, Sanjay Sangvai, you know. <laughs> then I would have been more happy. The third thing, what happened is, I was in Gonda and these people came shouting slogans and, you know, they were doing all Murdabad and all. So I invited them for a dialogue. And, and they actually agreed for that. So, I invited them to a room and had this dialogue. Uh, but after a while, they they saw that they were they had fallen in my trap. So then they walked out. So I would say that that you know we we should make an attempt to 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 dialogue. I mean that is the only Gandhian way. So there can be no other. And and if the if the opposite side is mature, I think they would agree to live with difference. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so what I will do is now I will bring in the the guest speaker, uh, you know, he has studied Gandhi uh, more deeply. Uh, you know, uh, if you if you read his book, you will realize that how much he has read before writing. So we will today we will uh, ask him to respond to this question, and then of course we will be there to continue this discussion for future lectures. Yeah, what what is your question? Can 
Hello. Yeah. So while he changed in terms of certain practices that he conducted by, by himself, so what about like certain demands where Ambedkar proposed with regards to separate electorates, while the urgent need for separate electorates then was that uh, the voice of a Dalit member would be basically the voice of the political party, like the Congress would be represented. But instead, when we would have separate electorates, where Dalits would elect Dalits, voices of uh, Dalit political parties and their actual representation would be more substantive, which was something that Gandhi here was profoundly against, and even like after his death during the drafting of the constitution as well. The Gandhian idea that was reflected was that separate electorates would only promote separatism, which of course Sardar Vallabhai Patel said. Right. So, sir, how exactly do we reconcile his views with regards to practicing, uh, like, so, sort of inculcating certain practices against fascism, but also uh, sticking to these ideas where he refused separate electorates, which were against substantive voices? That is something which requires some attention. When we uh, take up the issue of caste and Gandhi, and maybe uh, one can also speak on that. Uh, so let me uh, bring him in. This is his book, Gandhi, A Hope in Despair. And he is essentially, uh, so he has a PhD in law from Osmania University. Uh, he studied the impact of uh, the new economic economic policy. Yes, uh, impact of new economic policy on industrial jurisprudence. of the workers on this campus. So uh, I have invited, hopefully when they are finished with their march, they will come and we will also discuss that. Uh, he uh, was not a Gandhian to begin with. He uh, was a Marxist. And uh, so he, for some reason, he started reading Gandhi again. And then he developed an interest in Gandhi, and then he realized that you know, by uh, ignoring Gandhi for a long time, This is something very uh, peculiar, but the Gandhi's role before independence, you know, uh, was probably more important than what is considered about him in independent India. He has been reduced to his portraits being hung from offices, government offices mostly. Even the government, even the, the parties who would believe in his principles would not follow them in practice. And presently, there is an environment in country where, where you know, uh, he's being run down and uh, there are all kinds of allegations on him. It seems that everything ill in India, you know, can be, and Gandhi can be held accountable for it. And uh, he seems to have created a lot of problems for us. He is responsible for the partition and, you know, appeasement of Muslims and all such things. But uh, his contribution cannot be ignored um, because it's a reality that globally, I mean, if one personality can be identified with India, it is done. There's no other person. And globally, he is still relevant. Uh, in addition to, you know, inspiring Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela and others. Most recently, uh, very surprisingly, in the Muslim world, where in country after country protests were taking place, there was a protest in which they were carrying Gandhi's portrait during the Arab uh, 
Arab Springs. So everybody who is fighting for justice for some cause, which is very dear to them, where they, and especially if they're fighting against a stronger opponent. And yesterday I mentioned how, when I was speaking to the leader of Hamas party in Syria, uh, which is considered a terrorist organization by United States and Israel, the leader said he was inspired by Gandhi. And when, when one of us asked him, how could you, you know, consider Gandhi as your ideal because you use violent means to counter Israel, he said, we uh, consider Gandhi as an ideal because he has taught us how a weak can fight against a strong. If your opponent is, is much stronger than you, then Gandhi gives you the inspiration to fight for your rights against such an opponent. So with these words, I will bring Advocate Raghu Kumar to you. And um, he uh, will, of course, yeah, please, uh, talk about Gandhi. Uh, he has a presentation. And then recently, he has come out with a book on Lohia, which was released uh, just last month uh, by Ramchand Guha. So we would also like to hear something about this book. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, after Gandhi, Loya is considered the second most polit important political thinker in this country. Uh, he too considered himself a Gandhian. So with those words, Raghu Kumarji, welcome. Thank you, Sanjeev Pandeji. Sir, no, sir. <laughs> uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. I am Raghu Kumar. So I think I, my voice is uh, a bit louder because I am a practicing advocate. I have to address the judges who are sitting far away from us. And, and we have to be very clear also in our submissions. Not like uh, an academic submission because judges won't like uh, any legal theory to be proposed before they're accepting the Supreme Courts. <laughs> Only in Supreme Court they will entertain legal theories or at times in the high courts. Otherwise, they mostly talk about uh, the law. They invoke... Uh, that uh, uh, famous uh, statement of uh, Wendell Holmes Jr., uh, the famous uh, Supreme Court judge of uh, U.S., who said once, addressing the young lawyers when they were undertaking their oath, Wendell Holmes said, uh, my dear young man, this is the court of law, not court of justice. And it's not yet attained the courts of justice anywhere in the world. It's only courts of law we have. So, <laughs> Uh, as a lawyer, we have to do that uh, very tough business before uh, the judges, and you will be doing in the future, hopefully. Uh, up to, say, around the 2012, I'm more convinced. I, I don't say I'm absolutely a Marxist. I was never a Marxist. I was never a Gandhian even today. I, I cannot say that I'm a Gandhian today. Uh, I'm not a Lohian. I am not anything, but I have studied these three personalities, Marx, Gandhi, and Rohia, very intensely. Uh, up to 2012, I was more and more or less convinced that uh, uh, Marx has a better, uh, uh, what's called as uh, tools with him to change the society. And my reading of Gandhi is just like any young boy in 1970s, uh, Gandhi, Tata, Mahatma, a good man, gentleman, very, you know, very soft, satyam, ahimsa, all these things. This is the image we have, and sometimes, because we have read something more also, and we know that Gandhi is not such a, we cannot explain Gandhi in such a simplistic terms. That much I know. But I have not thought of at any time in the past that I will be reading Gandhi once again. And for the first time in 2012-13, I purchased one smart phone, mobile where from I, I was having access to uh, internet and everywhere, wherever I go. And I was enjoying uh, 
YouTube channels, all these things. And uh, then I found that the Gandhi whom I read earlier is not available anywhere. He is missing. And there is a lot of diatribe against Gandhi. There is a lot of you know, people were pouring a lot of uh, venomous arguments against him. I don't know why. Because Gandhi, it's not something new. Because I, I saw in the uh, left circles, uh, Marxist circles, trade unions, that they had a lot of opposition to Gandhi. They, can, they just discarded, dismissed Gandhi as a, a revivalist, basically. And then I know to some extent that Ambedkar has also discarded Gandhi, uh, uh, saying that he's, uh, he has not opposed caste system in the way he has to oppose. Or what even if he has opposed, uh, what uh, Ambedkar said uh, is uh, uh, too late and too little. It's one of the famous uh, descriptions of Ambedkar on Gandhi, too late and too little. So this is uh, the thing. And then these are all defendable arguments. See, these are all the areas where I can start defending by saying, no, 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 this is Gandhi, what actually he means or what he thought. But the, the criticism on Gandhi took a different level after 2013. Gandhi is portrayed as a villain. So far, Gandhi was portrayed, discarded, dismissed as irrelevant. But now Gandhi started getting a, a different image altogether. And ultimately, he has joined uh, only one poster at the toilets, public toilets. So this is the image that was obtaining on Gandhi by the time I started, I thought of rereading Gandhi. And uh, this was also an occasion where one of my good Marxist friend, uh, when he found some four or five books on my table on Gandhi, he virtually banged me and he said, he, I will not talk to you if you go on reading Gandhi. Then one of my cousins, who is a young girl, maybe uh, 12 years or 15 years younger to me, she came to me somewhere in 2014, immediately after the election results were announced. She was so shocked to find a book of on Gandhi on my tables. And she said, Uncle, till yesterday we thought that you were a Marxist. We have no grievance with you. We had no grievance with you. But the moment you said that we are, you are reading Gandhi, I have to, I have to say bye bye to you. So this is a typical atmosphere under which I re-entered into Gandhi. <laughs> and then, uh, it is in 2015, for the first time, when I started re-reading Gandhi, I found a book called as Gandhi's Philosophy and the Quest for Harmony, written by Anthony J. Perel. And then, uh, I spent about uh, four years exclusively reading Gandhi. From 2015 to 2019, I have restricted my studies to one, to my profession, my legal profession, and to the extent of, uh, you know, uh, doing justice to my claims. And then all the remaining time I spent on Gandhi. Then the, the book is the outcome of that. Today, I'm not going to discuss the whole of the uh, uh, content of the book, but one or two areas in my book, that is, what Gandhi thought of the state and what he thought of the individual or a citizen, a concerned citizen in the state. These are all the only two areas I am going to touch. I briefly touch about uh, uh, the uh, I briefly touch about uh, six areas after consolidating my study on Gandhi. I have arrived at some six areas to understand Gandhi. That is one is the best, how the Western pacifists thought of Gandhi. Because uh, by 1930s, West was undergoing a terrible you know, uh, uh, experiences. Their, their enlightenment reasoning, what we call as Victorian age reasoning, uh, a, a kind of uh, you know, uh, justice, equality, human reasoning, supremacy of human reason, reasoning has totally failed in the two world wars. So the entire Europe was looking at uh, some savior who can uh, who can who can they look at and uh, see that some kind of pacifism is restated in a, in a better in better terms so this is uh, tolstoy roman roland or the two pacifists who have tried to locate gandhi in the european context so this is one of the uh, areas which i have studied is how the western pacifists understood gandhi 
Then the second one is the Indian Marxists. Indian Marxists, by and large, discarded Gandhi. There's, there's no doubt about it. But there are some people who have practically either worked with Gandhi or stayed with him for some time. That is one such example is Pannalal Das, uh, Pannalal das Gupta, who was a, a revolutionary Marxist in the West Bengal, who stayed with Gandhi for some time in Alipur jail, somewhere in 19, late 19, uh, uh, mid 1940s. After coming out, he wrote a book called as Gandhi a Revolutionary. Unfortunately, that book was not published till 1989. And the first Bengali version probably was published in 1989. The English version has come in 2011. So this is one a typical different understanding of a Marxist on Gandhian philosophy. A, a, a totally, a, a, he has taken Gandhi in terms of a historical person, in, in terms of materialist uh, approach, and also how Gandhi can be related as a social scientist. This, this was exactly what uh, Panarad Dasgupta has done. How to locate Gandhi as a social scientist. Then, this, the next is uh, some psychologists have tried to understand Gandhi. And uh, there were various understandings, not one or two. But I have taken Eric Erickson's book called as Gandhi's Truth on the Origins of Militant Nonviolence. This is one book which I was so impressed. And then the other areas which I have studied is in terms of social psychology, colonial and post-colonial theories, Ashish Nandi, the intimate enemy. This is one uh, area which, has, uh, uh, which I have deeply tried to understand. Then uh, there is the historical and philosophical view was presented to me by Anthony J. Perel. Anthony J. Perel is a uh, professor of history, uh, retired in, from Canada, Cal Calgary University, Canada. And he wrote about uh, four books on Gandhi, uh, Gandhi's uh, philosophy and the quest for harmony, Gandhiana, uh, and one book on uh, Hindu Swaraj, and then an another book is there, which I am un unable to remember. Now. Then the last uh, and the uh, Sixth branch of study which I have used to understand Gandhi is the study of anarchists. In fact, one anarchist historian uh, from America, he wrote a book on Gandhi that is George Woodcock. That book is titled as M.K. Gandhi, published somewhere in 1969. But apart from that, after going through that book, I too try to understand on my own as to how Gandhi can be called as an anarchist but a different anarchist. Anarchist in the sense, in the West, in the European sense, anarchist means he just demolishes the systems. He does not believe in authority. But most probably anarchists used violence as a means of achieving the ends. But where Gandhi differed, he, there are, he has two examples in the Europe also. One is in Tolstoy, and there is one Thoreau. And there is also uh, Prince Kopatkin, many of uh, us will be knowing him. So these are the three uh, uh, the the uh, George Woodcock's point of view, understanding Gandhi as an anarchist, is one the sixth way of understanding. That is why these six systems I called as Shad Darshana of Gandhi. The six ways of understanding Gandhi. So this is only I am introducing the book to you. Now I come to my understanding of Gandhi. That is the development of Gandhi's political thought. I am more concerned about the Gandhi's political thought here in this particular because after reading Gandhi, after reading Anthony J. Perel, Yeah, that's a, that's a, it's a, it's a, that is the doubt, even Anthony J. Perel also, at the conclusion, because some of the scholars, some scholars have understood Gandhi, especially uh, Partha Chatterjee, has, uh, has written that Gandhi believes in some kind of enlightened anarchy. 
and earlier one of the earliest uh, uh, central legislative assembly member which is shankar he also for the first time he called gandhi as an as an anarchist and then one more member of the central legislative assembly called uh, gandhi as a uh, what's called as a, a anarcho something he defined gandhi in the same sense as an anarchist this is one of the prevalent ideas even if you go to uh, wikipedia and type uh, uh, anarchist in india you will find the name of gandhi that am that also because in this in the in the hindu swaraj there are certain areas where he when he as you said in hindu swaraj there are certain seeds that there are certain seeds of his future governance talking about anarchy okay what is that kind of anarchy is anarchy is something something different but he has evolved over a period of time because this uh, statement that he wanted to have a state in terms of enlightened anarchy is a statement given by gandhi somewhere in 1944 so this is uh, from 1909 to 1944 and for the idea of enlightened anarchy also he gave some explanation what does he what does he mean by enlightened anarchy because uh, uh, i i i come to that again uh, then the south african experience of gandhi especially Uh, this is my idea i am trying to put before you he is the one person who has seen three englands the england in england is a very sophisticated country talking about justice talking about equality providing equal opportunities for everybody england in england is a very sober country england as a colonial power is something else that is england in india is something else and even india also because of its cultural history and the past you know a lot of legacy of it they dealt with india probably in a delicate way but if you see england in south africa that is totally a different uh, uh, england so what gandhi experienced in south africa are three types of england the third england he has seen then uh, i think this uh, this is an important stage in the development of gandhian thought there was a correspondence between uh, there is one there was one guru called rajchand bai to gandhi he is a jain uh, diamond merchant but also was an expert in jain philosophy uh, for the short while when uh, gandhi stayed as a practicing advocate in bombay he was more associated with that rajchand bai then after going to south africa somewhere in 1894 june may or june he wrote a letter to rajchand bai about making about 27 questions as to what does it mean by atma these are all traditional questions conventional questions because gandhi in 1893 means he is born in 19 uh, 1869 uh, 1894 means he must be around at some 20 25 26 years so those questions were highly naive they were not having any intelligent uh, questions we cannot say that they are intelligent but uh, there was a reply from rajchand bai saying that the, the one of the main questions gandhi raised is shall i continue my struggle in south africa for the sake of the my indians or shall i withdraw from all these activities go for my own moksha then rajchand bai after giving a detailed reply to each question that's an important dialogue you see that is published by uh, uh, that uh, uh, gandhi oh, huh? uh, naujeevan trust but it's a very important document to study in the development of gandhi after replying to all the questions raised by gandhi rajchand bai sends uh, two books to gandhi one is uh, 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 vasishta geeta then second one is bhagavad gita the dialogue in the vasishta gita is that king rama at the age of 16 years he was thoroughly disappointed he says that i have learnt everything on earth at the age of 16 rama says to his guru i learnt everything 
Now, according to the Sanatana Dharma, the man's highest goal is moksha. Because now I have studied everything. I need not undergo this Grihastha Ashrama, then uh, what is called Vana Prastha. I will directly go to Sanyasha. This is the question raised by uh, Rama. Then Vasistha says, no, you cannot do that. Hindu Dharma does not accept a person directly going from the, uh, what is called as the Brahma, uh, Brahmacharya to Moksha, the Sanyasa direct. Then after reading all these things, Gandhi comes to a reasonable conclusion that there is nothing like a Moksha. This is an important stage of this world. There is nothing called an individual Moksha. Moksha is always related to the people. If I cannot work for the liberation of all the people around me, I cannot get moksha. This mo mo relating moksha to the community is the first philosophical development of Gandhi, which occurred around 1894-95. Until unless Gandhi is understood with the, in, in the perspective of this particular dialogue between him and Raj and Boy, uh, uh, Gandhi's development as a political philosopher cannot be understood. And then, So, this is one part of the development of Gandhi's, Gandhi's political thought, the dialogue that happened between him and Raj and Bhai. Then, after coming to this area of moksha, then after coming to this idea of moksha, the next question before Gandhi was, how an individual can deal with the bad state? Can an individual oppose the bad state and what is the method of opposing the bad state? I, this, this is a, uh, the West has understood the relationship between the individual and the state as something called as a, a right oriented understanding. That is, a, it is the rights which uh, decide the place of an individual in the state. But is there any alternative approach to this issue? That is what Gandhi tried to explore, duty-oriented approach. That is, whether what is the duty of the citizen if the state is bad? From 1894 to almost all through his life, he was trying to do or reinterpret some of the earlier classical texts and the terminology within it. So, what, how do we understand this ashrama of Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Varaprastha, Sanyasa? And what is that individual in the modern, modern times can think of these stages? This is a, uh, an important area where I am trying to put before you. Prior to 8th century, if you read any classical Puranic text in India, you will never find an individual becoming sannyasin directly at the young age. There was no phenomenon of a young man becoming a sannyasin by, uh, by 16th or 17th year. Last occasion was the Rama's dialogue with his Guru Vasistha in terms of epics. Then after a long time, there was an occasion where young man has become a sannyasin, that is Shankara. And from 8th to 9th century onward, there is a trend in Indian society that people were becoming more and more uh, renounce, reno, renouncing the world and go, going into the sannyasa ashrama without taking the two stages of living in the society. So if without a person living in the society, facing the problems of the society directly, 
going into the sannyasa is not a traditional concept which is available in the sanatana dharma was the first of the observations made by Gandhi. So he opposed the very idea that a person who wants to moksha, he cannot go to uh, what's called, he cannot, uh, uh, what's called as a uh, uh, refuse to be in the society. He has to be in the society. Moksha comes only within the society. I, uh, this is one of the fundamental findings which Gandhi has come uh, during 1894 to uh, uh, somewhere around 1900, beginnings of the 1900. So you cannot jump the guns was the idea. Hello, hello. Uh, you spoke about uh, Gandhi opposing the idea of skipping the two stages of Grihastha and Vanaprastha and moving directly to Sanyas. Has that got any relation to the duty oriented approach? That yes, that's what I am saying. Until, unless you are a Grihastha and be in the society, you cannot perform your duties. That is next, next, next element of that idea is this Purushartha. This Purushartha is the next element in the classical Hindu philosophy. That is Dharma Atta Kama Moksha. How these were, these, were, these were defined to be the prime duties of every person, male or female. You have to fulfill these four areas, Dharma, Atta, Kama, Moksha. Now, this is a classical pastoral society's value, maybe around 1500 years. How do we relate these four ideas to the modern society was the question before Gandhi. And then he said that politics, politics is the dharma, only politics is the artha, politics is the kama. In the modern, modern society, a person has a duty to participate in the politics. He cannot avoid politics. An apolitical nature, which was more prevalent in the Indian society, that was the area where Gandhi was trying to reinterpret and tell the people that this Dharmartha Kama Moksha in the modern sense has to be understood, especially this Artha. That is, Artha means all the um, material activity. And in that material activity, you have to keep a space for politics. And this is the entire uh, thing, what I said is the analysis of Anthony J. Perel as to how Gandhi understood this dharma, relocated dharma in terms of the modern society. And what is that dharma, duty of the citizen, when he encounters a state which is falling, which is a bad state. Now, this is one part of uh, his life that is reinterpreting the traditional text into the modern language. That is one aspect of it. And again, locating these areas within the modern Western thought. So, in that process, he has taken 
Ruskin, Thoreau, Tolstoy, the Quakers and the Fabians. Most of the people uh, uh, who studied Gandhi quote the Ruskin, Thoreau, Tolstoy, but the influence of the Quakers and the Fabians are not much seriously understood. Because uh, the Quakers is one movement in the Europe which has created a new idea of religion. Till then, religion, Christian religion is understood as an institutionalized religion where every person has to go to church and pray the God through the uh, missionary, that, uh, that head of that church. But Quakers who believed that there is no necessity of the intermediary between me and God. I can directly converse with the God. So this is one important movement and in fact Quakers were killed, executed in large numbers during the 19th century, even 16th, 17th centuries also, they were subjected to terrible witchcraft, witchcraft killings. So this Quakers also having a lot of influence on Gandhi because he has studied Quaker movement, he was associated with the Quakers, important Quaker leaders while he was in England and also while he was in South Africa. And one of the ashrams which Gandhi ran in South Africa was located near about a Quaker's farm. Then the Fabians. The Fabians also had their own influence on Gandhi because most of the people who studied Gandhi, his biography, especially when he stayed in London, they say that he was associated with the Vegetarian Society of London. He was the secretary also for the visit. But that Vegetarian Society itself is a, is a, is a what is called as a, a, a kind of a cover. It was basically a Fabian society. It was the, the club, the Vegetarian Society was started by a Fabian, run by a Fabian, and the whole discussions and the influential personalities in the Vegetarian Society were Fabian societies. So this is a, another area which has deeply taken in, uh, uh, into Gandhi's idea. Then the, challenge, the choice between violence and non-violence has also occurred during this period. What is the charge? What is the nature of uh, uh, if you if you want to oppose the state? How do you oppose the state? Because in the Western Europe, in the, in the Europe especially, right from Machiavelli to Marx, the act, the political activity is for attaining the power. Power is to change the society, and to attain the power, the means is violence. There is nothing like uh, any hesitation in, in, in these three, four areas. But when he was studying these Western thoughts and the, he was interpolating with the conventional Indian texts on the same subject matter, he was coming with the idea of violence and non-violence in, in, in this area. Then he has tried to develop, he has not developed because he was never a theoretician. He was never a systematic philosophy uh, philosopher. He was not a system builder, basically, because he was opposing any kind of system building. So he has tried to create a cover of theoretical thought which has its own native roots with the sufficient ingredients from the ingredients from the West. This is the idea. And remember that all these people, Ruskin, Thoreau, Thomas Type, the Quakers and the Fabians, were Within the European society, a subaltern movement. The, the mainstream movement, even in the Europe by that time, was Marxism or capitalism. But these, these groups were constituting the lower, uh, the, the subaltern areas of political thought in the West. So he has taken most of the political thought from these people along with reinterpreting the Indian traditional text, especially two items. That is, one is Ashrama Dharma, not Ashrama Dharma of uh, this fourfold division of the people, but the Ashrama Dharma, which means Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, and Sanyasa, and then Purusha, Purusha Arthas, called as uh, uh, Dharma Artha Karma Moksha. These two ideas were reinterpreted, and along with the ideas of the West, he tried to develop his own understanding of civil disobedience and satyagraha. About uh, Gandhi's emphasis on duty-oriented approach and how people have to be in the society and participate in the political process. 
right now even some groups of the society which are prevented from even participating in the process because of their group identity for example caste groups certain caste groups now in that sense is it not correct to say that because they are deprived of their right they are unable to perform their duty so in that case also would gandhi say that no it is your duty to perform participate in the political process when they are in the first phase being deprived of even participating in the political process or there are some gatekeeping mechanisms which do not let them enter the political process i i don't find all solutions for all problems in gandhi i am very clear because he he is a, con, a, a conventional personality uh, a traditional personality but trying to emerge out of the fold by reinterpreting the text on his own without depending upon any previous authority on the subject matter so he has not yet come to understand the significance of caste he has not yet come to understand how to resolve the issues of the caste because he is he has not yet i can say that he has not yet evolved that's what i said he whatever ambedkar said about gandhi that it is too little and too late he is an absolutely correct statement on gandhi that we have to accept it Yes, sir. <laughs> See, he, I, this is uh, this is the this is how I understood Gandhi, not uh, the way like you know people talk about Sakya, Himsa, and a soft man talking about you know sitting in the uh, in the ashram. That is not uh, the Gandhi I found after reading Gandhi. Then by 1909, he came with a serious critique of the Western civilization. This is also a part of his political thought, an important contribution to the political thought. Because in the, in the Hindu Swaraj, people are understanding Hindu Swaraj only as an advisory to the militant groups, not to, not to go for militant path or to adopt uh, uh, non-violence. No, that's not the only purpose of writing Hindu Swaraj. Hindu Swaraj is basically a critic of Western civilization. And one of the authors he has quoted in Hindu Swaraj is Edward Carpenter. Edward Carpenter was one of the uh, best critics of the European society, especially the modern society as it was evolving in the West, in the Europe by 1890s. So Edward Carpenter has constituted as a major source of uh, understanding the Western civilization in Hindu Swaraj. And he is quoted also in uh, page number 24 or 25 in Hindu Swaraj. <laughs> Thank you. Training is 
Cool, I'm going to do them on the boards. No, we are, we are accustomed as advocates. We, uh, we When we are arguing, normally judges will interfere and ask questions. Uh, then the other side will make a very pejorative statement. Uh, he heckles us or something. And then we, we, we try to ignore this man and uh, play some arguments only to the judge. Huh? So these are all the things happening. You are all judges. And I am, I am the advocate arguing on behalf of Gandhi. <laughs> because Gandhi never wanted any advocate to argue his case in any court. So, uh, until his death, he remained like that only, admitting the charge whenever occasion comes. So, uh, now he is no more. I can be the defense lawyer for him for some time. <laughs> because all through his life, he opposed uh, uh, the idea of defending his case. He was admitting the case at the beginning itself and asking, demanding for the highest penalty available under the law for that particular uh, 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 what's called as crime. Now he is no more Gandhi. So somebody can defend him. He cannot object to the defense. <laughs> eh? Then I uh, see uh, this Hindu Swaraj constitutes an important document in the evolution of Gandhi. First stage is his experience of the South Africa and his dialogue with Raj Chand Bhai. This is an important stage in the development of Gandhi. Then in that process from 1894-95 to till to uh, 1909, he was evolving various ideas. He was discussing continuously. He was giving even, uh, he was announcing awards within his ashram for persons for suggesting a better word for, for, the, for a particular thing. So this was uh, the way things were going. In, uh, uh, he was having some Mangal Gandhi, I think uh, his relative. He was assisting Gandhi in formulating words and re, 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 restating the familiar uh, idioms. So this is how the, he was. He has become the critic of Western civilization, especially the civilization of the West in the 18th, 19th century after industrial revolution. The Gandhi's observation is after industrial revolution, the West says that I am developing. Gandhi says that you are degrading. And this is the basic distinction in understanding the uh, 19th century Europe. And then back in India, back in India, South Africa was a small thing. See, the entire Indians were there only about 40,000 to 50,000. So he can make them united. He can, uh, they all, all can assemble at one place with all the dissensions. There are occasions even in South Africa, people have beaten him, even Indians. Uh, uh, because uh, when uh, he went uh, with an agreement uh, with the South African government on the poll tax and uh, issuing the identity cards, at one stage he, he agreed with the government's proposal, then he was beaten by his own colleagues, even in South Africa. But that was a small scene of activity. Now the canvas has changed. It is a bigger canvas now. So now, here back in India, there were three questions before him. One, you are a saint when you are coming into politics. This is the first question. This question was raised not by one or two, several people, including Tilak. Tilak made the same question. You are a saint, why you are coming to politics? A British missionary questioned Gandhi. You are a saint, why you are coming to politics? And uh, this uh, argument of uh, Gandhi on, on all these things, see, he has uh, tried to understand what is the role of the concerned citizen and what is the role of a saint and what is politics? What does it mean by politics? Politics as understood by the West as power from Machiavelli to Marxist. And then another area of concern for Gandhi is secularism. Because as a student of law in Europe, in London, he 
he is, he knows what has been in the secularism. But secularism has developed in a particular historical context in the West. That is a, a, a conflict between the state and the church. In the Asiatic other countries and in many, in many other countries other than Europe, this conflict between the church and the state is not available because church and the state constitutes one single unit. So there is no struggle between the state and the uh, church for the supremacy. So secularism also has to be restated, re-understood in, in the Indian political thought. You know, one of the concerns of Gandhi. Then how to understand this word religion? How to locate religion or how to place religion within the political uh, political theory was his concern. Then what does it mean by democracy? What does it mean by parliamentary form? And what is uh, the Asiatic experience? He has taken the Indian native experience uh, vis a -vis the European experience in, in formulating his theories. So the first question in 1920 was uh, raised by one British Christian missionary, are you a saint or a politician or a saint dabbling in politics? And then similar question was also raised by Gandhi as to are you a saint and if you are a saint, what business you have in politics? This was a question raised by Tillich. And for the, for, for the first thing, he wrote an extensive reply in his uh, Young India magazine. Extensive reply saying that I am neither a saint not a politician, but a concerned citizen. I cannot allow politics to be a vicious coil without the element of morals. And if I have to introduce, infuse morals into the politics, I have to necessarily take religion as a root. And for me, religion is morals. This is the answer, a lengthy answer given by uh, Gandhi to that particular question. Then, uh, uh, when in the next session, we are going to talk about Lohia and uh, his philosophy also. This statement, Lohia has enlarged the idea of Gandhi and his understanding of religion while he is saying that religion is a long-term politics and politics is a short-term religion. This is one of the quixotic statements made by uh, Lohia. Very difficult to understand, but it has a deeper meaning. Religion is a long-term politics. You cannot avoid religion. Religion continuously tries to uh, bang your heads as a as a as a uh, modern uh, citizen. You cannot avoid it. But then, how do you tackle with that? What are the short-term politics you have to deal with the religion? And then. One thing also must be understood before understanding Gandhi in the area of religion that he has discarded every interpretation of the then existing conventional scholars, including Gita, including religious texts, including Purushartha, including uh, uh, this uh, 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 fourfold uh, uh, life stages. In all these things, he has discarded, refused to accept the authoritative. Uh, statements already existing. That is the reason the interpretation of Gita given by Gandhi is not accepted by any mainstream Hindu scholar. There is no single person who quotes about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the interpretation of Gita given by Gandhi. Because Gandhi said that Gita is only a poem. It is only has origins in the mind of a poet. There is nothing like Mahabharata where these kind of things are happening. There is no necessity of, there is no possibility of uh, a, a poem being told in the midst of the war. He was talking about all these things and he said that it is only a mental struggle a poet was undergoing in placing between the idea of uh, duty versus what is called as the general welfare of the society. Then another important area where we have to understand where we can locate on this uh, subtle of the thoughts is his dialogue with Roman Roland in 1931. It's also a lengthy dialogue happened after the end of the second round table conference. Uh, uh, Roman Roland along with about uh, 10 to 15 important Western intellectuals interrogated Gandhi for more than a week. It was actually seven days. And for all the seven days, there was an intense dialogue on what does it mean by truth, what does it mean by art, 
what does what the relationship between art and truth this was a discussion which went on and uh, the the replies given by gandhi were uh, so so problematic to the western scholars to understand or even to uh, appreciate because he was saying that uh, when when uh, roman roland question uh, then how do you say that how do you say that truth can be identified Gandhi said there can be two truths. One is universal truth, and the one is another individual truth, which is uh, which is emerging out of antarvani, the inner voice of a man. Then Roman Rolland, as a Western scholar, asks, how can there be two truths? One universal truth, and within that one individual truth. Then Gandhi explains that truth can be not only two; it can be in thousands. All thousand truths can also exist within the universal truth. And then art, art, European art always thought that if you if you if you um, read from Plato and onwards, the understanding of art, what they were saying about art is art is nothing but imitation of the uh, nature. So uh, uh, when the when uh, uh, Roland and others have proposed that art is nothing but a kind of imagination or an image of the nature. It is not nature itself. Then how can you say that truth can be incorporated into the art? Then again, Gandhi says that anything which is not based on truth, even if it is art, it is a false thing. It is a falsehood. It has to fail because any art based not on truth is by, by all means an untruth and it has to fail. This is how the, the dialogue went on for about seven days. This here, it is here, he talked very heavily about uh, this idea called an inner voice, Antarvani. Uh, you know, I have also quoted some of the some of the dialogues in my in, 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 quoted extensively in the question and answers. And the source also is uh, Romain Roland's sister has typed everything. <laughs> yeah, and she has released that book later on. And then here comes the main discussion on which I am trying to uh, uh, place Gandhi in terms of political theory. Because the state, according to Gandhi, is an institution necessary for realization of the values of Artha. That means uh, there are out of the four values of the human beings, there is one value which is called as material value, materialistic value. And for that state, according to Gandhi, is an institution. It is not an institution for everything. Only to achieve the materialistic stability, materialistic gains, materialistic improvement, materialistic development. For that only state is a necessary instrument. Then this is one of the statements made by Gandhi, quoted by Andhra Jepera. But at another place, he also said that State represents violence in concentrated and organized form. He continued, individual has a soul, but the state is a soulless mission. It can never be weaned from violence to which it owes its very existence. So state and violence are one of the two things which are interwoven. State means violence. State Without violence, state cannot exist. And this is one of the statements which was understood as Gandhi opposing the state as an anarchist. Then the, that we should obey laws, whether good or bad, is a newfangled notion. This is a modern notion. What Gandhi was trying to say is, just because a law is made by the state, whether it is right, right or wrong, whether it is bad or good, I have no necessity of obliging it. I have no necessity of following it. And this is a new notion which has come when the state itself was uh, becoming a, a, a concrete unit in, during the 19th century in the Europe. So that we should obey laws, whether good or bad, is a newfangled notion. There was no such thing in former days. The people disregarded those laws they did not like and suffered the penalties for the breach. It is contrary to manhood. If we obey laws repugnant to our conscience, such teaching is opposed to religion and means slavery. 
then man, man made the man made laws are not necessarily binding on on the man and this is ultimately what uh, part of chatterjee has quoted nationalist thought and the colonial world says uh, gandhi uh, the state could never be the appropriate machinery for realizing the, his state his ideal state the enlightened anarchy this is where gandhi ultimately comes to his understanding of the state that is enlightened anarchy enlightened anarchy is an idea where if everybody is uh, every citizen is enlightened to a higher extent he, he does not require any state at all there, is, there are two ideas there is a marxist idea of abolition of the state that is a state has to be abolished at one point of time but marxist idea says that for that you have to undergo proletarian dictatorship then an intermittent social so, socialism then communism and in the last phase of the communism you will be abolishing the state and for this a lot of process of violence and force will be there but here gandhi says that state can be abolished in another way when citizens are highly enlightened when he knows his duty when he, he knows his rights there is no necessity of state interfering and telling the people that you have to behave in such a way so he is, he says that my idea of the ideal state is enlightened anarchy So I am uh, almost uh, coming to the, uh, I am now going to take uh, questions from you by closing this discussion. My, my point of view that Gandhi has his own contribution to the political theory. Unfortunately, we have understood Gandhi only in terms of non-violence, peace, truth. These are the three, four terms which we invoked for Gandhi. But there is a lot, lot of uh, source for political theory. In, in Gandhian literature, but they are uh, they are not uh, systematic analysis, they are not uh, systematic statements, and he was not a stable person. He was always having contradictions. He said that I am a contradictory man. He says that I am living in contradictions, and he he repeatedly said that without contradictions there is no growth, and I am a man of contradictions. He accepted that I am a man of contradictions. And uh, in case, if you find that I have two statements, please kindly take the latest statement. And he also added that normally my statements will not be contradictory, but people are thinking that they are contradictory. So if you think that I am contradicted, take the latest statement of me. So he, this contradiction, because he has entertained several areas to be accommodated within his political thought, that is, he wanted to give sufficient space. To the traditional conventional Indian uh, past. He wanted to give sufficient accommodation to the modern Western thought. So he wanted to have a kind of, he, he does not believe in synthesis. Remember that. He is not a Marxist who believes in dialectics. So he was an anti dialectician, basically, Gandhi. <laughs> so he said that um, he, 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 he tried to locate in multiple places his ideas of uh, uh, political philosophy. And uh, because of that, Gandhi poses a lot of uh, problems to him. Then he has repeatedly invoked the one word called as Ramarajya, which is a matter of inconvenience, definitely a matter of inconvenience for the caste theoreticians. Because caste theoreticians remember Ramarajya as one area where they were, they were put to sufferance because, uh, because of that uh, story of Shambhuka. Uh, uh, they, they, they said that this is how the Ramaraja. We cannot accept your idea of Ramaraja. But there are certain uh, uh, people who have tried to locate the idea of Ramaraja, not exactly the Ramas Raja. There is one phraseology of Tolstoy that the, uh, the kingdom of God is within you. And he was equating that terminology of the kingdom of the God is within you with his idea of Ramaraja. And uh, this Ramaraja ultimately is something called as a state of statelessness, but not through abolition of contradictions, but making it relevant through enlightened individuals. And then there are two areas which I wanted to convey to you that there is no one single Gandhi for understanding. There is a evolutionary Gandhi. And uh, from, a, from a name, uh, Jain, 
Vaishnavite, uh, Vaishyavite, not knowing the external world beyond his own small village, to the universal personality when he has grown. He entertained several of the uh, contradictions, and all the contradictions can be understood in the way you want. He is an open, uh, what's called as an open theory. It's not an ended, closed theory for Gandhi. So Gandhi is an evolutionary person, evolving personality, which can be said that this is particular Gandhi. Even his non-violence non also has several layers of understanding. It is not uh, as straight as that, because when Poland was invaded by uh, certain uh, uh, Western uh, uh, forces, he said that Poland, Poland fought back with arms. And he said that Poland has done a wonderful thing. And uh, when a uh, uh, woman comes to him and says that what if what happens if an aggressor joins or uh, tries to uh, overpower me, he said you have nails which are given by God to kill the other man with that. Use the necessary violence. So like that he was saying so many things. When, the, when a cow was suffering uh, uh, for death for a long time in his ashram, he said kill it immediately. So these are all the things which pose certain problems about understanding Gandhi's, non, Gandhi's violence or non-violence. So Gandhi can be located in multiple sources. That is his advantage or a disadvantage. That is his success or that is his failure. He, he offers a contradict, several contradictions within him, but I try to understand Gandhi mostly in terms of how he put politics into the center of the human activity in India. And especially that politics which will not hesitate at any point of time to oppose a bad law or bad state. And of not only opposing the bad law or bad state, opposing it and entertaining the penalty that state views on them. This is the Gandhi I wanted to project before you. Thank you. And before going to the next topic, you are open for any questions. He will, will never consider it because <laughs> he even thinks that I am good. There was something that came on to them. by practicing the practice. So there is no people doing the right thing. How do you speak? How do you make them realize what you are doing is wrong? Change the status quo. The, the Gandhi's explanation or uh, uh, what's called as a answer to this question will be just like Gandhi. Face it. Die for the cause. Voluntarily die for the cause. In the during the uh, Hitler's resign, he put the same answer to the Germanies. Germanies were virtually agog with his statement. They could not understand, imbibe such a kind of idea that they have to voluntarily die for the sake of voluntarily die, non-violently opposing Hitler. That was a threatening idea for them. But uh, Gandhi said, how many lives are lost uh, uh, in Hitler's uh, onslaught? Probably non-violence also would have involved the same uh, sacrifices. I think he is trying to indicate the answer. See, violence, even if you oppose the system through violence, even if the evil doer is not, uh, you are ready to challenge the evil doer with, with arms, he will also come with his own uh, mission arms and ammunition, then how the issue can be resolved? It's not that if you are empowered, it is not that the, the, the person who is uh, ruling you over a period of uh, thousands of years will keep quiet. He will also come with arms. Then what, where is the solution? Can there be a solution in the war which you are thinking of? And supposing, supposing you imagine a condition that Yes, a war took place. 
And uh, first thing, if you take a, a communist manifesto, in the first three, four pages, you will find one sentence. It is true that there are contradictions. It is true that the contradictory forces are opposing each other. And the con there is a possibility that both the forces can be demolished. That is the force opposing and the force which is uh, uh, trying to maintain status quo. Both may get demolished. Then what remains in the society? What is that society we are anticipating? So these are all the questions. I, I said, uh, the, the, there cannot be any simplistic answer. You are the evil doer is suppressing you. You want to, you are not in a position to oppose him. You oppose with arms. Nobody prevents you. Nobody says it's wrong. Gandhi never said it's a wrong. Gandhi always anticipated that weaker sections can use the arms. Because instead of being a coward and, and uh, submitting to the evil force, it is better to die fighting the evil force. But this non-violence is taught for the brave who has the power and still maintain non-violence against the opponent. It is not for the weak. It is never taught for the weak to use non-violence. It is, it is given uh, uh, even because that because of that only in the 1922 when uh, uh, that the struggle fails in the, uh, at the Chauri Chora, he, he says it is in Himalayan blunder. And when he prepares himself for the 1930s Salt Satyagra, he trains his own uh, uh, what's called as uh, Sevaks. How to face that violence of the state? Because at private, in 1922, he has not given any training. He thought that the training he has given is sufficient. But non violent struggle requires a greater, uh, what is called as uh, uh, confidence in you and a greater wearer in you. So, because you have to face the onslaught, you have to face the arms. So, if you feel that uh, I am weak, I cannot face it, instead of keeping as a coward, I fight with the arms. There is absolutely that forms a sufficient part of Gandhian philosophy. Special Uh, sir, my question is mostly regarding how, like, um, Sandeep so spoke about how Gandhi reformed his views on caste in the sense that he attended the uh, weddings and everything and uh, changed his own practices. But, so, there was one demand that Ambedkar had proposed with regards to separate electorates, where the main justification for separate electorates was that instead of having one Dalit representative from, let's say, the Congress, who would basically be voicing Congress opinions. Let's have separate electorates for the depressed classes where they can elect their own members and essentially uh, like elect members from parties representing their interests so that they can themselves voice their opinions for more substantive um, like opinion in the assembly itself, right? So, but that demand was consistently opposed by Gandhi and the similar call was taken up later by Sadar Vallabhai Patel on the name of separatism. But so how can we exactly like reconcile his, the change in his own practices with the larger institutional changes which he was still opposed to where he was still opposed to giving or uh, like not giving representation to Dalits in that sense but giving them giving separate electorates which would give them the voice shall i answer yes. these are two standpoints ambedkar says give us separate electorates we will elect our own representative Gandhi was saying that if you allow separate electorate, the social segregation which is already there becomes a political segregation. Whether we accept Gandhi or not, that's a different issue. I have nothing to say about all these things. Standpoint of Gandhi is if you allow separate electorate for the uh, depressed classes, for thousands of years, there is a social segregation. Now you are introducing political segregation. How do you tackle it? There is a necessity at one point of time that the two groups representing the 
the the Hindus, the upper caste Hindus, and the Dalits, there must be a point for reconciliation. There must be a point for reconciliation because you have to live here. That was what exactly Gandhi was trying to convey, always, all through. These are the two standpoints. I don't say he is right or he is wrong, but it's the standpoint of Gandhi must be known for people. His stand was if you allow separate electorate for the Dalits, it becomes a permanent segre political segregation and it can never be resolved. There must be one point where they have to sit together and discuss. Now, who has sit, who has sat and discussed, uh, signed the document? And the, what was the earlier argument? Hindu Mahasabha was saying the, uh, in the uh, second round table conference that we are the sole representatives of the Hindus. Then Ambedkar, that Gandhi said, then talk to Ambedkar. This is the issue. If you feel that you are the sole representatives of the Hindus, why you are hesitating to talk to them? Talk to him. Then uh, where is the where is the basis for talking? This is the Pune Pact was the basis for talking. Come together, discuss, settle the issues. These are the who. In fact, who were the signatories in the Pune Pact? One side Hindu Mahasabha, the other side was Ambedkar. What was Gandhi doing? See, let me tell you. By all these things, I am not going to. Convince you. I have no duty to convince anybody. It's not, not my way of doing the things. Let us know the facts. Being convinced, being taken, even after noticing this particular issue. If you say that Ambedkar is more correct, I have no problem. And I will not say that Gandhi is more correct. Because Gandhi, in his own limited, uh, what's called an intellectual capacity, he might be wrong. I don't deny it. But what he said must be known to the people. What he said, please, please, please. Yeah, use the mic, use the mic. Please, let us not think that I am defending Gandhi. I, I have taken the duty of defending Gandhi, true. <laughs> but only to the some extent. Let's move on. Thank you. He expects people to come and discuss because they have to live together. But when they are all when the two groups are not equal so does he presume equality in the society or does he think that such a discussion would would produce equality if not then there is one more thing which uh, I have, uh, is he an assimilationist in the sense that he has also tried in different ways to uh, generate one national identity among people when he says that uh, when he um, asks for development of hindi in the southern states and all that so does he expect, does he confuse equality with unity and uh, uniformity to some extent? For Gandhi, equality is uh, something like an absolute equality. He imagines, he, ima he takes an imaginary stand that all men are equal. In one meeting, he was addressing a Dalit group. He wanted the leader to come and uh, take place along with him. That man came up to this podium but started uh, saying that uh, I will sit uh, here. here to he said, first you feel equality with me. Come sit here. Let me see. See, it may be an overstatement because a cultural uh, what's called as a thousands of years of cultural uh, oppression may not create such a kind of congenial condition in the in the depressed class to sit along with uh, the, a person who is said to be uh, an upper caste. But what Gandhi was saying is, if you don't sit along with me, how do I, I start the very topic of equality? Does equality mean that they should not preserve their own identity? To some extent, when you say that you have to interact. You know, later development, you see, identity as a social intervention is a later, in, a later entry into political theory. Not when Gandhi was alive. Gandhi was not aware of even this idea of identity politics and what is the role of it. Because he was 
he belongs to see uh, have you ever uh, tried to understand uh, one booklet written by lenin uh, i tell you the name of it tolstoy the mirror of russian revolution it's an 80 page uh, pamphlet written by lenin uh, somewhere in uh, 1910 19 before the revolution uh, tolstoy the mirror of russian revolution and Lenin was saying that there are several questions. How can he be the mirror of Russian revolution? Because Tolstoy was a pacifist. Tolstoy was opposing revolution. Tolstoy was opposing arms. How can you call Tolstoy the mirror of Russian revolution? You read the text. It's a wonderful text. Lenin says that nobody is ready for revolution, including Tolstoy. And Tolstoy represents the majority of the Russian. So that is why I am calling that he is the mirror of the Russian state, Russian nation. Gandhi is also the mirror of all the contradictions available in the Indian society. But see, there, there are something like you know different stands. See, for example, Gandhi has taken a stand that first let us achieve political independence. We can resolve all the issues later on. Ambedkar said, no, our experience for thousands of years is unless the social equality is achieved first. Certain guarantees are given on social equality. We cannot get into the independent uh, India because, and again, it falls into the hands of the uh, upper caste Hindus. These are the two stands. He may be right, he may be right. And people may take different stands on the issue. But let us not blame each other as uh, somebody has deceived us or somebody. This language, I am more worried about the language which is developing as if somebody has hurt the interests of no. There are there are stands. Some takes the stand that once I achieve political independence, I can sit because always Gandhi was saying that who is the Britisher to resolve my issues? After all, he goes tomorrow, and it is again me who has to sit and do the things here. This is one one understanding of the issue. The other understanding is no, we need him because it is it is before him before that arbitrator we can decide the things. So these are the two political stands. How to understand the political stands, how to locate them, how to place them according to the uh, dialogue, according to the understanding is uh, respect to uh, thinking process. I don't have anything to say about it. The text, maybe text worth reading is what Gandhi and Congress have done. Then, um, so it was it so for the second question? Post 1930 and 40, construction was done. Especially this, uh, this writing said after fact, Harijan comes into it. Related to this question, comes up by 1940s, Gandhi, 43, 44, and selling in large terms. No caste, equal caste privileges must be performed. That's where we in the HST. His items are not the same caste. There are so many niceties. I am not worried about because uh, uh, he, he has a way of approach towards the problem. You have one way of approach to the problem. We are not antagonistic. See, the, the philosophical understanding of the West, which has gone deep into our minds, is everything is antagonistic, contradictory, dialectical. I am, I am standing before you to say that there is nothing like dialectical. I have come out of that Marxian understanding of dialectics. I am only saying that everything is complementary. Every force is a complementary force. If a force crosses its limits, becomes an aggressor, till yesterday he was a revolutionary defending the rights of the oppressed, then he has become an aggressor. 
then a countervailing force comes automatically. They are complementary. Now, for the for me, for me in understanding the world history, I have basically come out of the understanding of dialectical movement, and I am more relying upon complementary uh, movement of history. This is uh, the next thing which, uh, in terms of Lohi, I am going to tell you. <laughs> yes, it's. Uh, There are thousands of ways of understanding an issue. I am, I am the first man to say that they are all possibilities of understanding. This uh, uh, one of the famous uh, poems of Walt Whitman. Am I contradictory? Yes, I am contradictory because I contain many more things. This is what Walt Whitman wrote, uh, writes in uh, uh, one of his poems. So, and uh, contradictions are a reality of life. But they need not be taken into something called as opposites. All these things are, is a big process. Uh, like you know, in the in the human body, several parts will be working for a for an ultimate aim of digesting the food we have taken. See, they are not uh, uh, the body never takes them as contradictory things. But human society, especially the Western idea, this is where I am trying to. Uh, uh, talk about uh, certain areas of decolonizing the mind. They have introduced certain ideas in our mind. One of that idea is the movement of the history is the movement of uh, class struggles. For me, it is not a uh, class struggle. For me, it is something else. Various conflicting ideas, they have to be naturally. Uh, if there are no conflicting ideas, there are no contradictions. It's a dead society. Is a society of uh, no human being, lively human beings. So I I always say that contradictions will remain, may remain, and then we have to uh, what's called as understand how to resolve the issues and go ahead. That's all. This is what I understood from Gandhi after reading Gandhi. Before uh, reading Gandhi, I was also uh, thinking in terms of uh, dialectical way of understanding. In me, Gandhi has caused an immense change in understanding the history, philosophy, and everything. Then, uh, no presentation. I will go for the next session, Lohia. Total time running out. Huh? Then, uh, then we. Oh, no problem then. I am <laughs> like, uh, like an Indian. I am a timeless being. You are a timeless being. Kala Tita Vikyatma. Okay. Uh, then uh, uh, this is the end of uh, discussion on Gandhi. I just uh, actually I am supposed to talk about uh, Lohia, Lohia's, my book on Lohia. This is uh, uh, the work which I have written on Lohia. Revisiting Ramana Harlohia, uh, challenges to the theory and practice of alternative socialism. Basically, this is an idea that in the in the in, in the world thought, if somebody talks about socialism, it is only the socialism of the Marxist variety. So people are convinced because Marx has claimed that his philosophy, his theory is the most scientific. So this tag of scientific has created such a kind of impression among the people that any other thing, any other kind of social, social socialism, other than Marxist variety of socialism, he is either utopian or Fabian. Utopian by saying utopian, we say that it just in the in the in the imagination, in the idea, it can never be achieved. By saying Fabian. We convey a meaning that we will always be doubtful about what form. But Lohia has challenged this idea very powerfully because Gandhi, after independence, Gandhi is no more. But Gandhi divided himself into three parts. One is official Gandhi who has joined the office. He has become the prime minister, he has become the governors, he has become the Raj Pramukhs, he has become the chief ministers, he has become the MLAs, MPs, wearing the Khadi. And there is one more Gandhi 
who remained in the ashrams. That is Ashramit Gandhi. And uh, there are several Gandhis who followed that Ashramit tradition, like uh, you know, Baba Ve, even uh, Jay Prakash Naran also at, at one point of time joined. But there is one more Gandhi who was opposing the Britain, that oppositional Gandhi. That oppositional Gandhi was also a serious Gandhi because without that Gandhi, there is no Gandhi. So Rohia took that part of Gandhi, oppositional Gandhi. Then he participated in the freedom struggle, but between 39 to 1942, he underwent certain typical experiences, especially this, it's not just 39 to 42, 39, between 39 and 42, he started scribbling down his ideas, but he underwent a, a typical challenge within a, a, a unit called as Congress Socialist Party, which started in 1934 as a subgroup within the Congress. But in 1934, certain challenges uh, were, uh, were, uh, were placed before the Congress Socialist Party. The first ever challenge was when 1934 Congress Socialist Party was formed. And by 1937, various communists, because the communist parties were outlawed by that time, they also joined the socialist parties. And the first challenge has come when the primary resolution of the Congress Socialist Party was to be passed. Because Congress Socialist Party wanted freedom of India as one of the primary objectives of the Congress Socialist Party, which was opposed by the mainstream communists. This is the first challenge which Lohia saw, because Lohia was one of the uh, policy maker or the, was a member of the committee for uh, policy uh, draft of the Congress Socialist Party. Then from 1934 to 1939, he has encountered several uh, uh, stands of the uh, uh, Indian mainstream communists, mainstream Marxists. Then between 1939 and 42, he started writing his uh, uh, what is called as uh, economics of remarks, the first ever theoretical work of Lohia. This was the basis where Lohia challenged the mainstream Marx. The first challenge what Lohia made is there are the, the, the Marxism has evolved certain laws certain theory for the evolution of the capitalist state. That is, the history undergoes in the process of slave, serfdom, feudal and capitalist. And in the capitalist society, there will be certain contradictions. The capitalist will exploit the workers. Exploit, workers will continuously undergo pauperization. Because of the pauperization, they get socialized. Because they get socialized, they form into an advanced proletariat. There will be a struggle for the control over the production forces, control over the production forces, and then advanced, being an advanced uh, 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 class, proletariat will win over the capitalist, take over the uh, position of the production forces. This is the basic idea. But by the mid of the 19th century, with the mid of the 20th century, the greatest observation is nowhere there was a pauperization of the labor. America, there was no pauperization of labor. Europe, the pauperization has come down. In fact, it, instead of increasing, the European workers started feeling more secured. Then American workers, by the beginning of the 20th century, has given up the very idea of uh, struggle. What was the reason? This was the question before uh, Lohia. And in that process, he examined the very theory of value. Whether theory of values created by Marx are correct or not. Whether, because why pauperization has not occurred is explained by different theoreticians all over the world. But none has gone, no, gone into the very basic of theory of value. So Lohia started questioning that the very basis of the theory of theories of value are incorrectly proposed. And especially the capitalist development was incorrectly understood by Marx. He has located the development of capitalism and the increased uh, what's called as a uh, richness of the capitalist cap only as an internal mechanism that is between the capitalist and the workers. But in fact, the society has not become rich because of the contract. The capitalists are not getting the surplus value just because of the exploitation of the cap, uh, working class. Because by the beginning of the 20th century, by the demands being accepted for eight hours, 
the concept of 12 hours and uh, uh, out of which four hours being appropriated by the cabinet minister has gone. It lost its relevance. So there must be something else for the reason of the development of the uh, growth of the capitalist class and which he has located in the colonial exploitation. And then he started saying that the, the, the policy uh, formulations of Marx has to be restated. And then he came with an alternative socialism which has understood the challenge of equality in seven ways. That is the challenge of equality between north and south between the West and East, between the uh, rich and poor, between the women and men, and between the uh, uh, languages, between various, various communities, groups within the society, and uh, in, internationally. So seven layers of uh, equality has to be tested, understood, and challenged. This was, so the single understanding of uh, the uh, what's called as the class war between the capitalist and the working class will not resolve the issue. So it has to be tackled in subtract seven layers. And then he has again restated what Marx said. This is I'm briefly trying to put the issue. Uh, he, the Marx was saying that the entire history is the history of the class struggles, which uh, Lohia said it comes, the Marx has come to this conclusion because he has seen only one part of the history, one cycle of the history. That is a society evolving into a, a, a richness. But he has not, the West has not experienced the fall of the richness, which Asia has. The Asiatic countries like China, India, they were once the richest countries. They have fallen. They have seen the second cycle also. So, this is not exactly the, uh, what's called as class struggle, that is the cause of the uh, so social history. It is the oscillations between classes and castes. This is a new theory, theoretical proposition which was made by Loya, which requires a lot of serious consideration. And for me also, it requires a lot of time to explain. So this is the theory of history. That is what is called as the wheel of history. And he has studied, he has tried to locate the defects in the theories of history because in the theories of history, there are two prominent theories. One is a linear progression of theory. That is always society progresses. Ah. <laughs> then uh, the other is the society always undergoes cycles. So from top point it comes down and again goes up. This is a cycle. So there are two ways of understanding. And the West also has this kind of Indian, the uh, classical Indian society has that uh, Kala Chakra. Buddhist philosophy has that Kala Chakra. Jain philosophy has that Kala Chakra. Western philosophy is also in, the, in terms of uh, Arnold Royalme and then uh, Spengler. All these people have proposed some kind of cyclic theories. So Marx and uh, uh, Hegel has proposed a kind of a spiralic uh, growth of the society. Marx has proposed a linear progress of the society. So examining all these things, he comes up with an idea that this has occurred because every time societies try to develop with one single idea, with a single direction, that is one takes equality as the highest cause. One uh, takes uh, uh, fraternity as the highest cause. One takes uh, justice as the highest cause. And then from that initial movement, the society moves on in the single direction. So that has to be stopped. Direct the movement of the people should be from all the directions. Then only this issue of uh, inequalities which are occurring, recurring in the societies, the fall and the growth of the societies can be arrested. And that is what is called as, he says, that new civilization. It requires a lot of time for me also to explain the things. Thank you very much for, the, for this day, for giving this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Please. First thing, first thing is uh, 
Ramaraja. The word Ramaraja he used, he is no state at all. He is a kind of statelessness. With that idea only, he used that word Ramaraja. Probably he was invoking a word which is lost long in Treta Yuga. Because uh, the very idea of our uh, the Indian, uh, Indian tradition is the Treta Yuga, which comes after Kruta Yuga, is the least spoiled state of affairs. This Kruta Yuga is considered to be the highest, where everybody is equal, where everybody is happy. There is no dispute, there is no rich, there is no poor, there is no any, any kind of inequality. So from there the fall comes into the Treta Yuga. So that Rama belongs to that Yuga, that is the least spoiled state of political status or social status. So he has taken that image of Rama where there will be uh, absolute freedom and statelessness. Where even, uh, the, uh, that is what he says, even a water, what's called as a Bartolotikwan. Bartolotikwan, you don't know. So I will English language, you know. Washerman. Washerman also can directly complain to the king that this is the thing. And king is bound by accepting, he is bound to accept the complaint and investigate. And till that time he has to suspend the status of the queen also. So these are all the ideas which they, they thought that they are very ideal. Where absolutely there is no state. Everybody is a state. This is the idea of state he has taken uh, from that Ramaracha. And dhar, uh, this uh, Grihastha Dharma. See there are, one is this uh, Ashrama Dharma called as Dhammacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprastha and Sanyasa. These four stages are compulsory according to the traditional Hindu philosophy. You cannot jump the guns and take to the next stage. If this is accepted, because he says that a, a, a kind of corruption entered into Indian, uh, philo Indian philosophy of this area only after 8th, 9th centuries. So if this corruption has to be again eliminated, we have to accept that everybody has to undergo these four stages. That means you have to live in the society first. Rihastha Dharma means living in the society and facing all the things like you have to work under the king, that means you have to participate in the kingly affairs, state affairs, you have to be the critic of the king, that is politics, you have to do everything in the Rihastha. This is what he has located politics in Rihastha Dharma as the duty of every uh, uh, ordinary man to challenge the state, to participate in the politics, to change the society in terms of politics. And then he has taken uh, this Dharmartha Kama Moksha, both duty and artha. Artha means in all material activity. So artha and duty together combined becomes the political activity. So this is how he understood and re reinterpreted. So the idea of Rama, maybe comes true, maybe comes true to something which is akin to what the Kabir is talking about Rama. The Rama is here is not a Quranic or, uh, or a Quranic figure. Because here Gandhi's understanding is Rama as an inner consciousness of Dharma. That's his Rama is not the Rama which is being used by RSS today. This is not that Rama. If you read a little bit of Kabir, probably the Rama who is because Gandhi's evolving problem is reinterpreting tradition. Sampradaya ni reinterpret Chayana Gandhi Jesus Pedapan. Dani Valla Goda Gandhi Mida Hatya Prayatan Sarya. He wanted to reinterpret the entire Gita. And some people said, who are you? Because Prasthanatraya Vyakhyana should be done by Gurus. He says, uh, religion is fundamentally personal and you need not seriously need any, any kind of a task there. That was a very serious allegation on Gandhi. And how are you uh, who, who can come and say that uh, like, a, uh, like a quacker? He will say that you can read uh, uh, Gita and you can interpret it in on its on your own. He says religion is a personal experience, so there is no need of 
any mediator and all that. So what happens to the Mathas? You have to read at least the introductory part of Let Us Kill Gandhi, where seven attempts have been done on his life. Why? Because his, his radical reinterpretation. And moreover, the, the frequent word you used or the idiom you used is Nirbal ke bal wrong. This is the idea. Yeah. He is not he is wrong, he is not the king. Yeah. He is the Nirbal ke bal wrong. Nirbal ke bal. He is the power of the uh, uh, what's called as being power powerless. That is how he has understood that word. And regarding that thing and all, at the moment in India rejected that entire idea of sannyasa. Namdas Bhakti movement, Bhakti states, rejected the idea of sannyasa. Probably the epitome of it is Sikh religion. Sikh religion denies the idea of sannyasa. It altogether denies the idea. Gandhi somewhere comes almost near to it saying that to enter into your renunciatory mood, you should qualify yourself through stages. Then only you can renounce. Because renouncing, new sannyasa and this kind of thing, you have to hold something, right? To leave it, leave something. That's what the idea is. Vaishnavism basically preaches it. Vaishnavism doesn't also doesn't allow traditional Vaishnavism of Ramanuja, Ramananda. It doesn't allow you to become a sannyasi before becoming a grah. That is exactly the problem between Shankara and Ramanuja. When Shankara proposed the Advaita and saying that uh, there is a Brahma Jivaka, Karmatma, you can the same. Ramanuja said, this is a dangerous proposition. This is a dangerous proposition. It totally takes away the uh, mundane activities from the life of the human beings. So it has to be stopped. The Paramarthika Satya has to be brought in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Advocate Raghu Kumar. And I will share his uh, email and phone number if anybody would like to interact further with him. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Very in depth. Yeah, phone matram, I will be putting off my phone between 2 to 5 o'clock every day. And after 9 30 also, most I close my phone. Not have phone or any communication after 9 30 in the night and between 2 30 to 5 30. That's my. Great. Ah, <laughs> 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 people have joined online, they would like to ask him. Pranav is there and Shiva is there. You or Shiva would like to, the class can disperse, but uh, Pranam, would you like to say anything to advocate Raghu Kumar?